In The Logic of Sensation, Deleuze demonstrates how modern painters have shifted the central emphasis of painting from space to time. But how can a still image show time? Deleuze's fantastic answer is through sensation, but not sensation understood as a personal or subjective experience, rather sensation understood as a certain treatment of color. Take for example Factor Roulin by Van Gogh. We will examine this painting in more details, but we can immediately feel that something unique is happening here that could not have happened in classical times. This infinite background seems to isolate the subject and throw him towards us, a subject who's not striking a pause but is completely spontaneous. This is not a narration, and it's clearly not about space. To understand what is at stake here, let's compare this painting with a classical image. Here, time is typically conveyed through the presentation of socioeconomic context, or a typical landscape, or even a reference to myth. The characters are engaged in some form of narration. Even in the case of portraits, the subject is literally immortalized. It is seized under the species of eternity, at its best, so to speak. Van Gogh's postman, by contrast, seems to be caught in the middle of a sentence. So Deleuze's goal in this book is to formulate the logic that has made possible this shift of emphasis from space to time. In order to do this, he must avoid references to objects and attitudes, representations and narrations, direct references, if you will, and focus instead on these elements that are inherent to the act of painting. These elements for Deleuze are the regimes of colors. In modern painting, regimes of colors convey this new form of time that is neither representative or about contingency nor about eternity. As he says, time itself seems to result from color in two ways, as time that passes in the chromatic variation of the broken tones that compose the flesh, and as the eternity of time, that is, as the eternity of the passage in itself in a monochromy of the field. So in modern painting, time is this in-between of eternity and contingency. The pictorial discoveries made by modern painters such as Cézanne, Van Gogh or Francis Bacon aim to show the new in-betweenness of time, which, as Deleuze says, is quite remarkable because it constitutes a form of perception that goes all the way back to the ancient Egyptians, and which Deleuze calls the third eye. Here are the last two sentences of the logic of sensation. The fact itself, this pictorial fact, that is what we see on the canvas, that has come from the hand is the formation of a third eye, a haptic eye, a haptic vision of the eye, this new clarity. It is as if the duality of the tactile and the optical were surpassed visually in this haptic function born of the diagram. So in this video, and in the next, we're going to see how Deleuze formulates this logic of sensation, and what he means by all this. Because he approaches the problem of painting from two angles, theory and history, we are first going to look at the theory. We'll see how Deleuze develops two main concepts, namely the diagram and analogy, and how from there he formulates a theory of colors which will allow him to define the regimes of colors that form the basis of time in painting. In the next video, we will delve into the history of painting, and we'll see how Deleuze uses it in order to confirm this logic. We will also see how he concludes his research with a major revision regarding the history of philosophy itself, a point which he makes quite provocatively through non-philosophical means and following his study of painting. So let us begin with the first concept developed by Deleuze in the logic of sensation, the diagram, which is central not just in the context of painting but also for the whole of his philosophy. What is painting? Let us begin with a very simple observation. The act of painting has three moments. First, there is the preparation. The artist has an idea or a mandate. He prepares the canvas and the colors and composes the subject. Then comes the execution of the painting, which mobilizes all the artist's skills. And finally, there is the result, this pictorial fact that we see at the museum. Usually we tend to analyze a painting solely on the result, the final image, and we invoke perhaps the artist's intentions. This may work in traditional settings where resemblance and narrative play a key role. However, this approach falls short in modern painting styles like action painting, for instance, where randomness prevails in execution. Modern painting forces us to shift our focus away from the finished product and expand our understanding to include the preparation and execution of the painting. For Deleuze, this means that instead of a descriptive or structural perspective, we will have to adopt a genetic perspective one which goes in-depth 
and takes into account the history of the painting itself. This is a bigger deal than it seems because a genetic definition turns things around completely at a fundamental level. Here is what Deleuze says. What does this act of painting consist of? Bacon defines it in this way. Make random marks, line straight, scrub, sweep or wipe the canvas in order to clear out locales or zones, color patches, throw the paint from various angles and at various speeds. Now this act, or these acts, presupposes that there were already figurative givens on the canvas and in the painter's head, more or less virtual, more or less actual. It is precisely these givens that will be removed by the act of painting, either by being wiped, brushed or rubbed, or else covered over. This process of selection is remarkable because it shows a complete reversal from our classical approach to painting. Instead of a model idea that is to be copied on a blank canvas, in a way that evacuates contingency and randomness as much as possible, the act of painting is now defined as the act by which all given ideas, stereotypes and cliches are wiped away by contingency. Instead of a complexification, it's a simplification. The artist encounters chaos, in the sense of cliches, and has to struggle against them somehow. The struggle between antagonistic forces is what Deleuze calls the diagram. As he says, the diagram ends the preparatory work and begins the act of painting. There is no painter who has not had this experience of the chaos jam, where he or she no longer sees anything and risks foundering, the collapse of visual coordinates. This is not a psychological experience, but a properly pictorial experience, although it can have an immense influence on the psychic life of the painter. Painters here confront the greatest of dangers both for their work and for themselves. It is a kind of experience that is constantly renewed by the most diverse painters, Cézanne's abyss or catastrophe, and the chance that this abyss will give way to rhythm. Paul Clay's chaos, the vanishing grey point, and the chance that this grey point will leap over itself and unlock dimensions of sensation. The encounter with chaos can give way to a real catastrophe. The diagram is the point where everything can go wrong, where forces can become destructive. But precisely what are these forces that are at play here? The diagram consists in the encounter between the active forces of chaos that are instantiated through the hand and the passive forces of perception that are instantiated through the eye. The properly pictorial experience that Deleuze describes consists in the encounter between these two types of forces and their encounter produces a rhythm which truly constitutes the diagram. The diagram is indeed a chaos, a catastrophe, but it is also a germ of order or rhythm. It is a violent chaos in relation to the figurative givens, but it is a germ of rhythm in relation to the new order of the painting. This new order can give way to two opposite situations, each of which defines one aspect or pole of the diagram. First, it can happen that the eye wins over the hand, and the new order of the painting thus becomes a pure abstraction. Deleuze says this, Abstraction is a pass that reduces the abyss or chaos, as well as the manual, to a minimum. It offers us an asceticism, a spiritual salvation. Through an intense spiritual effort, it raises itself above the figurative givens, but it also turns chaos into a simple stream we must cross in order to discover the abstract and signifying forms. In abstraction, it is the eye, or passive vision, which dominates the hand. It is in this sense that abstraction tends to negate the diagram. It negates the organic activity of the hand. And in this process, the eye dominates so much so that the hand becomes internal to the mind, Deleuze says. A now all-powerful eye will exercise its tyrannical domination by coding the chaos. It follows that what abstract painting elaborates is less a diagram than a symbolic code on the basis of great formal oppositions. It replaced the diagram with a code. This code is digital, not in the sense of the manual, but in the sense of a figure that counts. Digits are the units that group together visually, the terms in opposition. In abstract painting, the code can be made explicit, as is the case with Auguste Herbin's plastic alphabet, where letters are associated with certain shapes and sounds that make his paintings not just a code, but the display of a code. What about the second pole of the diagram? From what we have seen here, we can expect that the relation between eye and hand will be reversed. Instead of subduing the hand to the eye, the hand will become dominant and the painting will be about pure movement. Here's what Deleuze says. A second path, often named abstract expressionism or art informel, offers an entirely different response, at the opposite extreme of abstraction. This time the abyss or chaos is deployed to the maximum. Somewhat like a map that is as large as the country, the diagram merges with the totality of the painting, 
the entire painting is diagrammatic. Optical geometry disappears in favor of a manual line, exclusively manual. The eye has difficulty following it. The manual line has a very fascinating status. Instead of forming a contour and delimiting a shape, it runs wild on a canvas, it exceeds it, seemingly changing direction at every point. This is the mighty Gothic line, one of Deleuze's favorite concepts, which he finds in the great art critique Verhinger. The Gothic line is a pure expression of this powerful and wild movement. But why does Deleuze say that it attains a power greater than one, becoming adequate to the entire surface? The reference he is making here is to the mathematical theory of fractals. In Euclidean geometry, a line has one dimension, while a surface has two dimensions and a volume has three. However, the theory of fractals allows us to conceive of dimensions that are in between one, two or three. That is, it allows to conceive fractional dimensions. How can it do this? In essence, it repeats a certain type of operation on a given line. By doing this a certain number of times, the size of the dimension will increase. So a line that has one dimension will gradually tend towards a dimension of two. For example, a Koch curve has a dimension of about 1.262. It is in this sense that the Gothic line conquers the surface. As Deleuze says, this point of the diagram is a revenge of the manual over the purely optical. This time it is at the point closest to catastrophe in absolute proximity that modern man discovers rhythm. We can easily see how this response to the question of a modern function of painting is different from that given by abstraction. Here it is no longer an inner vision that gives us the infinite, but a manual power that is spread out all over, from one edge of the painting to the other. So in the realm of painting, the diagram presents two opposite poles, each of which responsible for unique masterpieces, of course, and Deleuze's point is not to say that one is better than the other, but rather both have in common to put a stop to the process of painting in some way, either through fixation in a code or through a manual execution. So Deleuze asks if there is a way to get out of this dualism. Is there an alternative path where painting can flow continuously without interruption? Deleuze identifies this third approach in the works of artists like Cézanne, Gauguin, Van Gogh, or Francis Bacon. Unlike the conventional optical or manual methods, this path will proceed from the middle, as it were, taking the best of both worlds. It will show how the diagram is in fact an analogical language. But what is such a language, and how does it come to be? This is the topic of our next section. We have seen that abstraction replaces the diagram with a digital code, while pure movement extends to the whole surface. So perhaps we may infer from this a new information about the nature of the diagram itself. Since that which opposes the diagram is digital, then it means that the diagram must be analogical. It's not a code, but it's something that has more to do with immediate resemblance. And yet, because the diagram can, if needed, leap inside the realm of representation, it must be ordered like a language. This is indeed what Deleuze says. Painting elevates colors and lines to the state of language, and it is an analogical language. One might even wonder if painting has not always been the analogical language par excellence. The analogy at play here is complex, and to make a long story short, Deleuze distinguishes three types of analogies, depending on whether resemblance is the cause or the effect, or as Deleuze says, the producer or the product of the image. Let us examine them one by one. First, there is the case where resemblance produces the image, for example through a device like a camera. Nellis says, resemblance is the producer when the relations between the elements of one thing pass directly into the elements of another thing, which then becomes the image of the first. For example, the photograph, which captures relations of light. The resemblance between the photograph and the state of affairs is superficial. It comes from the transport of relations of light that occur on the surface of the object. The model to understand this type of analogy is the mold, the casting, like for sand castles, where resemblance imposes itself from without. This is very different from the second type of analogy, where resemblance can be mobile, so to speak. For example, a football team can have one set of players at one time, and another set of players at another time, but the team remains the same. This second type of analogy still implies a kind of resemblance, but now this resemblance is not purely superficial anymore. It depends on a structure, a kind of interiority, an integrity. This interiority is created as the effect of relations that occur between terms of the structure. 
relations which Deleuze calls personal dependencies. The model for this form of representation is not the mold, but the internal mold, a concept that Deleuze borrows from the 18th century philosopher Georges-Louis Buffon, who describes a kind of mold that is both interior and mobile. This is why this type of analogy is not grounded in the mold, but is closer to what Deleuze calls a module. Finally, the third type of analogy is called modulation, a term famously borrowed from Simondon. This is the case where resemblance is the product. Instead of producing a mere superficial relation, which expresses a state, or a set of relations or personal dependency, which expresses the integrity of an organism, this third type of analogy supersedes or contains the other two. To mold is to modulate in a definitive manner. To modulate is to mold in a continuous and perpetually variable manner. He says, quoting Simondon, this continuous variation produces what Deleuze calls sensation. One says that resemblance is the product when it appears abruptly as the result of relations that are completely different from those it is supposed to reproduce. Resemblance then emerges as the brutal product of non-resembling means. In this last type of analogy, a sensible resemblance is produced, but instead of being produced symbolically through the detour of the code, it is produced sensually through sensation. To go back to Factor Roulin by Van Gogh, we can see that unlike a classical portrait, it does not aim primarily at resemblance, even if the real person that served as a model for this painting could be recognized from it. The identity of the painting, or the resemblance that it produces, is not a cause, but it's an effect. We can almost feel that this is Factor Roulin and nobody else. The monochrome background shows a desire to isolate the subject from any context, social or historical. All the cliches and stereotypes are removed. On the other hand, the subject himself is not treated as a shape to be filled with a color, but rather with little strokes of color that do not blend with each other. This is a famous technique called broken tones, which we'll come back to in a moment. As we have seen, the subject's posture is not formal, but spontaneous. He is seized as if in the middle of a sentence. He is a force, rather than a figure. The resemblance produced here is not symbolic, it's not spatial, but it's sensational, if you will. It occurs through sensation. As such, it is a form of resemblance that is deeper, Deleuze says, than any form of visual resemblance. We will come back to this example a third time in a moment. The point is that with this concept of analogy, Deleuze manages to cover all types of painting, from classical to modern. He names these three analogies as follows. Common, organic, and aesthetic. The aesthetic analogy comprises the other two because it can produce states of affairs as well as relations of personal dependency. As a modulation, it can mold and it can module, or modulate. But it also raises a big problem. If modulation is internal to the painting, such that it emphasizes relations of colors over relations of light, Deleuze needs to find a theory of colors that is not merely structural, but can actually account for the movement of time implied in modulation. This is the topic of our next section. Newton famously describes the classical theory of colors in the chromatic circle, where relations between colors can be described very adequately in spatial terms. In fact, Deleuze identifies three such types of relation, diametral relations, which define complementary colors, polygonal relations, by which a certain logic can be defined as a rule of passage from one color to the other according to the spectrum, and then there are random relations. As such, the chromatic circle can be very helpful to describe the color structure of a painting or to transpose certain relations. However, because it can only describe states or structures, it does not show the genetic aspect of color, that is, how colors come to be, their profundity as it were. Is there another theory of colors that can describe this, and where could Deleuze find it? It was Goethe who, in the 19th century, formulated a theory of colors that was not structural and material as Newton's, rather it was genetic. Goethe saw that colors, as opposed to light, are essentially somber. They are the result of a process, rather than aspects of a physical state of affairs, or a physical object such as light. The process in question is twofold. First, Goethe observes, pure white light can be darkened. And secondly, pure darkness can be illuminated. The white is darkened by superposing white layer upon white layer on top of each other. In this way, the pure white of light becomes more somber, and the first primary color appears, yellow. Reversely, black can be illuminated or dissolved into the second primary color, namely blue. Of course, the story is far from over yet. 
as we still need the third primary color. Here's what Goethe explains. Once the two primary colors appear, we can continue the process of intensification, that is the attenuation of the yellow or the illumination of the blue, until we reach some highest point of intensification, which for both colors turns out to be red. In fact, Goethe calls red the point of ideal satisfaction, it's a point of fusion. And because the point of ideal satisfaction is the same for both blue and yellow, Goethe's fundamental shape is not the wheel, but the triangle. And because yellow and blue can be mixed in practice and produce the color green, which is called the point of real satisfaction, the triangle of colors will be composed of small sub-triangles, where the other colors can be obtained as well. With the triangle of colors, Goethe demonstrates the way in which colors not only relate structurally, but generate each other in the reality of perception. But there is a twist to this story. As the colors are generated with their intrinsic properties of being saturated or of being washed out, they remain subject to the two basic operations of pure light, namely darkening and illumination. As Dulles says, color itself is capable of two very different kinds of relation, relations of value based on the contrast of black and white, in which a tone is defined as either dark or light, saturated or rarefied, and relations of tonality based on the spectrum, on the opposition of yellow and blue, or green and red, in which this or that pure tone is defined as warm or cool. It is obvious that these two scales of color continually mix with one another, and that their combinations constitute powerful acts of painting. The relations of value, which pertain to light, and the relations of tonality, which pertain to colors, provide us with the following set of possibilities, each of which has a name, and each of which is a regime of color. Some painters emphasize the importance of light over color. They are called luminists. Others emphasize the importance of color over light. They are colorists. Light and color provide very different spaces of perception. We can feel that space in Vermeer, for example, is not like space in Gauguin. But now, with the regimes of colors, we can approach an image not in terms of what it is materially, but rather in terms of its temporality, which defines how it is perceived. As Dulles says, we will be able to speak of optical space only when the eye fulfills a function that is itself optical, depending on the prevailing or even exclusive relations of value. On the contrary, when relations of tonality tend to eliminate relations of value, as in Turner, Monet, or Cézanne, we will speak of a haptic space and a haptic function of the eye, in which the planar character of the surface creates volumes only through the different colors that are arranged on it. So in other words, the third way of the diagram, grounded in colorism, will emphasize relations of tonality or colors over relations of value or light. This will define a specific type of perception, which Deleuze calls haptic. Now the word haptic comes from Greek haptos, which means to grasp. It pertains to the apprehension of colors, and it is opposed to tactile apprehension, which is the apprehension of relations of value or light. But what exactly does it mean to grasp space in haptic vision? Optical perception, as we have seen, is grounded in relations of light, and its relation gives space to the eye. They offer volumes and surfaces to perception, which is why such space is essentially representational and narrative. Haptic space, on the other hand, is grounded in the perception of regimes of colors, such that perception is not the reception of space, but it's the encountering of a force, a force which, as Deleuze says, is the creation of space. It is in this sense that it is an active sensation. There is neither an inside nor an outside, but only a continuous creation of space, the spatializing energy of color. By avoiding abstraction, colorism avoids both figuration and narration, and moves infinitely closer to the pure state of a pictorial fact that has nothing left to narrate. This fact is the constitution or reconstitution of a haptic function of sight. Dulles says reconstitution because he alludes to the ancient Egyptian mode of perception, in the next video, we will see in many details the technical and philosophical reasons why haptic perception was first discovered in ancient Egypt. But we are now in a position to understand why it is colorism that constitutes pure modulation, the purely temporal aspect of painting. The general rule is this. Relations of light that dominate luminism, as in classical painting, are pushed to the background. They are made non-representational, while the subject is treated in broken tones and brought to the foreground. Let us see two examples of this technique. About the painting we have encountered earlier, let us say this. One of Van Gogh's Roulin postmen exhibits a blue that shades into white, while the flesh of the face is treated by broken tones, 
yellows, greens, violets, roses, reds. The problem of modulation this concerns the passage of bright color in the flat field, the passage of the broken tones, and the non-indifferent relation between these two passages or movements of color. Indeed, the light blue background conveys luministic tones, but they are devoid of any representation, they are neutralized as it were, and there is little to no profundity left. The figure, meanwhile, is treated in broken tones, yellows, greens, violets, roses and reds, as Dulles says, each of which is added as an independent stroke. The haptic space is constituted in the non-indifferent relation between these two regimes. A second example comes from Cézanne, who operates along similar lines. In many of his still natures, he chooses a luminous background that tends towards lightness, whereas the subjects are treated in broken tones. There are differences, of course, between Cézanne and Van Gogh, there is no universal recipe, but of Cézanne, Deleuze says this in the English preface of the book. Cézanne's solution to the problem of color is basically a modulation of color by means of distinct touches that proceed according to the order of the spectrum. This is to say that Cézanne does not treat his subject freely, like Van Gogh, with valets, reds, etc., but rather the application of colors follow the order of the spectrum, which means that Cézanne is in this way more structural than Van Gogh. A third example would be Francis Bacon. In paintings like Figure at the Wash Basin, we can see a flat background, which is effectuated in a kind of attenuated yellow, and it contrasts again with the flesh of the subject, which here too is treated in broken tones. We will study Bacon in more depth in the next video, but for now let us observe that all of these artists have something in common, which is to open a purely haptic space through these regimes of colors that liberate time. As Deleuze says, it is as though painting were able to conquer time in two ways, through color, as eternity and light in the infinity of a field, where bodies fall or go through their paces, and in another way as passage, as metabolic variability, in the enactment of these bodies, in their flesh and on their skin. It is a chronochromie, in the spirit in which the composer Olivier Messiaen named one of his works. So now that we have found the general characteristic of modern painting, the third way of the diagram, our problem becomes quite simple. Can we find a confirmation of this logic of sensation in the history of painting itself? We will answer this question and many more in the next video. In the next video, we will begin with a study of Eugène Delacroix, whose career summarizes this fantastic passage from luminism to colorism. We will also examine the six criteria that Deleuze uses to describe the history of painting. Finally, we will see in more details why Bacon is said to be an Egyptian and how haptic space opens the third eye. As usual, I'd like to send a special thank you to my fantastic patrons on Patreon and Coffee. Your support is a great incentive to keep on making these videos, and I really appreciate your generosity. If you too would like to get me a coffee, please follow the links in the description. For now, thank you all for watching and see you soon.